welcome to our six o'clock service, everyone. Great to have you with us. I always feel what a great way to end a weekend to be worshipping the Lord together and just uh, just joining together, even if it's uh, only virtually uh, in this uh, time of lockdown. But uh, it's just a great way to round off the, the, the weekend and to invite uh, Jesus to come close and to refocus on him as we go into the new working week or whatever you're going to be doing with this week. So I pray that you come to this service really hoping and expecting and making room for God to manifest himself in your life in a new way and to be speaking to you and encouraging you. Uh, we're going to have a great time this evening, and uh, so we're going to uh, get right into that by singing just a, a great song of worship. Let's really uh, worship the Lord together with this song. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I try to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name.
So this is the penultimate talk in the series, Understanding Your Bible, and it's called The Spreading Gospel. Now, last week, we were looking at the theme of the gospel and how the gospel is, con is contained in the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, this week, we're focusing on how the gospel spread. Now, I was saying last week that Luke, who was a doctor and a traveling companion of Paul, he wrote a two-volume work called Luke Acts. Well, last week we were looking uh, at the, the first of those two volumes, the gospel account um, under his name. And in that gospel account, Luke revealed that three major things had been achieved by the arrival of the gospel. The first is, there was a new covenant, and that new covenant was described by Jesus in Luke 22, verses 19 to 22, in the breaking of bread and the pouring out of the wine, and when he said that this wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you, an agreement sealed by the blood I will pour out on you. So a, there was a new covenant. Secondly, there's a new creation. The cross tears down the barrier between people and God. And Luke highlights that in chapter 23, verse 45, when he says, The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. That veil, or, or thick curtain, was what kept the worshipper out of the presence of God. It shielded the holy place in the temple, and only the high priest could go through that thick curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement. And when Jesus died, that thick curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, i.e. from God to humankind. So God is saying, you can come into my presence now because of the sacrificial death of my son. There's a new creation. And then thirdly, there's a new community. Chapter 23, verse 45, Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures about himself and about their own identity. They were the community of believers who were to be sent out into the world to proclaim the good news the gospel. Well, that sets up the second volume of Luke's work, the Acts of the Apostles. And the summary statement for the whole book, the whole of the book of Acts, is in chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and you will tell all people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now that's the summary statement of the book of Acts. So having set out the, the scope for the mission in that verse, Luke divides the book of Acts into six sections. And the end result is that by the, uh, the end of Paul's life, the gospel is indeed being preached to the ends of the earth. He's at the center of the known world. He's in Rome, the capital of the global empire of the time, preaching the gospel. And that's why the final statement in Acts reads, For the next two years, Paul lived on his own in his own rented house. He welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God with all boldness and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Now, why doesn't the book of Acts uh, record Paul's death? Well, because the book of Acts is not fundamentally about Paul. It is, in fact, about the spreading gospel and about the, the, the fulfillment of Jesus' commission to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The book of Acts is really all about showing how that commission is fulfilled. And so to do that... Like I say, Luke divides the book of Acts into six sections. Each section describes the progress uh, of the, uh, as the gospel goes into a new area, and each section has a key statement of the gospel, and each section has a summary ending. So let's have a look at these six sections. The first section is the gospel in Jerusalem. 
Now, Jesus had said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So this section goes from chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 42. The key statement of the gospel in this first section is Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The summary statement is in chapter 5, verse 42 which says, and every day in the temple and in their homes, they continue to teach and preach this message. The Messiah that you are looking for is Jesus. Well, you get to the end of section one, and there's a bit of a gap because they needed at the end of the first section to deal with some internal administration. And actually, this is a real encouragement, I would say, for most pastors. How so? Well, here is the church with all of the New Testament giants in it, with miracles happening, with people who are caught literally lying, dying on the spot, with the resurrection of Jesus, still a recent memory, and even with all of that going on for them, they still had to reorganize and update their procedures and processes for the everyday ordinary things. Even in such an amazing church as that, Admin needed to be done, and people weren't happy about how they were being treated. (laughs) Well, they respond by picking some deacons who sort out the admin of of food, uh, the distribution of food, so that no one feels like they were missing out. This is addressed in chapter 6. And then after that brief pause, the spreading of the gospel starts again. And Luke introduces us to section 2. So section 2 starts with a new arena for the gospel, this time in Judea and Samaria. Now, if that strategy sounds familiar, it should do because it's the plan that was announced in chapter 1, verse 8. Well, this section goes from chapter 6, verse 8, through to chapter 9, verse 31. And the key statement in this second section is Stephen's defense in chapter 7, as he's been arrested and he's appearing before the Sanhedrin. Well, that section finishes, like all the others, with a summary statement. This is, in this section, is chapter 9, verse 31. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it grew in strength and numbers. The believers were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Then, section 3, it deals with the spread of the gospel in Antioch. Now, this is covered in chapter 9, verse 32, to chapter 12, verse 25. This is the breakthrough for the gospel in terms of it now being for a predominantly Gentile audience. We've broken out now from the gospel being just for the Jews. And the key statement in this section is Peter preaching to Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And this section's rounded off uh, and summarized in chapter 12, verse 25, which says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission in Jerusalem, they returned to Antioch, taking John Mark with with them. That's really drawing attention to the focus of the gospel moving into the Gentile arena. And then we get to section four. This is the gospel going to Asia Minor. That's modern day Turkey. Uh, And that's chapters 13 to 15. And the key statement in this section is Paul's sermon in Antioch of Pisidia, which is in chapter 13, verses 13 to 43. And the summary statement actually isn't a very good one. Others, other summary statements are, are quite positive, aren't they? But this section has a summary statement in the light of Paul and Barnabas' argument over John Mark. Such a big argument that they part company. And Luke follows the travels of Paul, and bearing in mind Luke is writing the account here, the summary statement is in chapter 15, verse 41 which says, so they travelled through Syria and Cilicia to strengthen the churches there. So each 
section that Luke gives us has the gospel going into a new environment. It has a statement of the gospel and it has a summary of that section. Each section is there to chart the fulfillment of Christ's commissioning of the apostles in chapter 1 verse 8. And so the focus of section 5 which is in chapter 16, verse 6, to chapter 19, verse 20, is the gospel spreading to Europe. Now, the gospel statement in section 5 is in chapter 17, as Paul addresses the people at the Areopagus at Mars Hill while he's waiting in Athens for his traveling companions. Now, this section, section 5, is is significant because the gospel has now spread not just to Gentiles, but to completely pagan Gentiles. Paul tuned into the mindset of the pagan people and addressed them in words that they could understand and relate to. And the summary statement of section 5 is chapter 19, verse 20. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. And then, finally, to section 6, where the gospel spreads to Rome, the place where all cultures meet. Rome was a cultural melting pot, the centre of the Roman Empire, which was the world power of that day, and so it was the place that symbolised the ends of the earth. Rome was where the ends of the earth all come together. Now, this section is chapter 19, verse 21, to chapter 28, verse 31. And there are several key statements of the gospel in this section, and they're all Paul's defense. For example, in chapter 24 and chapter 26, these are Paul's defenses, and they are really gospel statements. And then the summary of section 6 is in chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, which, which, as I've already mentioned, says that for the next two years, Paul lived in his own rented house. He welcomed all those who visited him. He proclaimed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. So the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. But one of the key features that is not often focused on is the question, how? How did the gospel spread to the ends of the earth? Now, there are lots of books that are written on church growth in the book of Acts and lots of sermons that are preached on it. But the fact of the matter is, Luke links church growth with the proclamation of the word of God. That was Luke's great emphasis. The church advanced when the word was proclaimed. The declaration of what God has done in Christ is the means by which the church was planted and grew and the expected norm of the church throughout Acts is growth and development. There's a recurring phrase in Acts that Luke links with the proclamation of the gospel. And it's this, a large number was added. You can see that throughout Acts, like chapter 1, verse 41, chapter 4, verse 4, chapter 6, verse 7, chapter 8, verse 4, and and, and so on. Throughout Acts, when the word is preached, numbers were added to the church. What is the word that's being proclaimed? That prophecy has been fulfilled, that Jesus Christ has lived, died and risen and is now enthroned. Sins are forgiven and eternal life is given in the name of Jesus Christ. One day he will return in judgment and he calls on everyone now to repent, to believe the good news and to be baptised as an outward sign of the inward reality. And that's it in a nutshell, the apostolic gospel message. That's what the apostles taught. They went throughout the world and that was their message. 
the spreading of the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. Twelve times in the book of Acts, uh, Jesus is proclaimed to be the Christ. He, uh, you see that, for example, in chapter 2, verse 38, chapter 8, verse 18, where he's proclaimed as the one to be worshipped. Or in chapter 2, verse 38, he's the one by whom sins are forgiven. Or in chapter 17, verse 31, he's the judge of all. He's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in chapter 2, verses 30 to 32, and chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. All this is important because one huge and damaging thought in Western theology over the past couple of centuries is that it was the church that raised Jesus to the level of God. And they did this over an extended period of time. Uh, this would argue that Jesus was a wonderful man, but nothing more than a man. And it was the early church that promoted him to being God. However, the book of Acts, which was written in the early 60s AD, which is just 30 years after Christ's death, is very clear that he was proclaimed Lord and Christ right from the beginning. The gospel, which was proclaimed publicly from just a few weeks after Jesus' death, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the power of the Holy Spirit motivated the disciples of Christ to go out into the world to proclaim that message. And the Holy Spirit equipped them with all that they needed to do it. In fact, the role of the Holy Spirit is, uh, is one of the major differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Christian believer has the Spirit in their life on a permanent basis. So, as John chapter 7, verse 39 points out, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. Entering into his glory, according to John, was about being lifted up on the cross. Christ hadn't yet been crucified, so the Spirit had not yet come. It wasn't until that point that the Holy Spirit was given. He'd always been at work in the world, but he wasn't given until then on an internal permanent basis. In the Old Testament... The Holy Spirit comes upon certain people at certain times and then leaves them. Hence, uh, in Psalm 51, David can say, do not banish me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That is an Old Testament, not a New Testament concept. God has said, he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. I will be with you to the end of the age. How? By his Spirit. So the big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit was the dynamic by which the word of God spread. It's the power of God within us. The Spirit of God living within the people of God, which is what Jeremiah was talking about in chapter 31, verse 33, when he prophesied by this the new covenant, uh, sorry, but this is the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts, i.e. it'll be inside you. I will be their God and they will be my people. He's talking about the Holy Spirit being given to believers permanently. Now, you can see Paul taking up that theme in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 as well. Paul, of course, became the major character in the book of Acts. He's the author of 13 of the books in the New Testament, and he quite simply was an extraordinary person. And his importance is highlighted by the fact that his conversion is recounted three times in the book of Acts, in Acts 9, in Acts 22, and in Acts 26. Well, from halfway through the book of Acts, that's chapter 13 onwards, the life and the work of Paul dominates 
the book. So if you compare the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of Paul, you can see that there's a continuation from Jesus' teaching to Paul's teaching. You can also see that there's a development as well. So if you look at the con continuity, so for example, in Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, Paul sets out the gospel. It's no different from what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, the gospel portrayed by Christ himself. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says that this good news was promised long ago by God through his prophets and in, in the Holy Scriptures. He sees the gospel as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. There's con continuity, too, with the other apostles. You know, in one of his early letters, Galatians, Paul says, in fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Now, this agreement was reached three years after Paul became a believer, and he went up to Jerusalem uh, to meet the church leaders there. And he says in Galatians 1 verse 12 that he received the gospel directly from God. The other apostles, though, confirmed that it was the same as theirs. So there was continuity between Paul's message and the message of Jesus and, the, and his first disciples. There was also development. Paul was an amazing theologian, and he developed wonderfully clear theology, well, clear, but not simplistic, which is what led Peter uh, to comment that our brother Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. <laughs> Here's an overview of the developments that Paul made. So he developed the doctrine of Christ and what it means for us to be in Christ. He said there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We died and were buried with Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised for the, from the dead by the glorious power of God the Father, now we also may live new lives, he says in Romans 6. He says we are now a new creation in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 he says what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore for the old has gone a new life has begun. And he developed a theology of how we should live in the light of who we are. We are a new person in Christ. So be a new person in Christ. Romans 12 puts it like this. Give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? And then he goes on to say, don't copy the behavior and patterns of this world, but let Christ transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Romans 12.2. In other words, because you are a new person, live as a new person with new standards, with new motives, with new goals, with new priorities. The motive for, for this uh, being thankfulness to God for all that he's done for us. And, and, and Paul developed this in his writings. His earliest letter, the, uh, the, the book of Galatians, which was written in about 49 AD, whilst he was still in Antioch, is an example of this. The problem had, a problem had arisen in Galatia, which was false teaching. People were saying that to be a Christian, you needed to be a Jew, first of all, by circumcision and by keeping the law. Paul's response was, you must not add anything to the gospel. Nothing other than the response of faith to the offer of forgiveness and a new life is needed. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. 
And then 1 and 2 Thessalonians came next in his chronologically speaking. Uh, they were written about uh, AD 50 to 51. And they were written from Corinth on Paul's second missionary journey. And the persecuted church in Thessalonica was growing, but they were asking uh, questions like, what happens to Christians who die before Christ returns? There's great interest in the second coming uh, of Christ in, in Thessalonica. And there were two particular lines of thought that were gaining popularity. The first being, or the false belief, that the day of the Lord, i.e. when Christ comes again, had already happened. And secondly, that the false behaviour that comes out of that false belief, that if Christ has already come back, hey, I don't need to work. The end of the world is nigh, so I'll just focus on that and look to the church to support me meantime. And Paul raises the question, if you're not going to work, how are you going to eat? And the prevailing thought was, well, the believers will support me. Now, Paul, of course, says both of those positions is wrong. He says, look, when the day of the Lord arrives, there will be no doubt. You won't miss it. In the meantime, you need to live in the real world. Yes, live with a healthy expectation of Christ's return, but get on with life in the meantime. And then there were one and two Corinthians. Uh, they came next chronologically in about 56 AD responding to the news of divisions in the church at Corinth and the specific questions uh, that Paul had been asked. So the believers in Corinth really had it tough because Corinth was, a, was really pagan. It's a really pagan city with a very immoral atmosphere about it. When people came to know the Lord, the difference that people needed in their lifestyle was immense. They really struggled with that. It ranged from the, the eating of meat sacrificed to idols to everyone looking out for themselves. Every area of their lives was challenged. So many of the old ways clung on in that church. There, there were questions about marriage, about food sacrificed to idols, about how to exercise spiritual gifts, and so on. And Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is answering those questions. So 1 Corinthians uh, looks at how to overcome divisions in the church and grow in maturity. But 2 Corinthians, Paul's defending his apostolic authority against rival teachers who were teaching a rival gospel in the Corinthian church. So Paul talks about his commissioning by God and about what the right motives are for ministry and what it means to be a servant of Christ. Well, there were four more letters that Paul wrote. There's Romans, which he wrote uh, around AD 58. And it's the great exposition of the gospel. And righteousness that comes through faith and the implications of this, of the way that we live both Jew and Gentile. Uh, Ephesians and Colossians uh, came next. They were put together because Colossians really, you could say, is an abbreviated version of Ephesians. And both were written around uh, AD 61. Both contain a lot of the same material. So the church at Colossae was a, a, a plant, a church plant of the church at Ephesus which was, a, and they were about 100 miles apart. And there were similar situations that they were facing. Uh, and that really uh, was around the, the emergence of something called Gnosticism. And the core belief in this is that the way to find God was some deeper secret spiritual knowledge. And Paul wrote these two letters to counteract that. And the summary of really could be stated as don't get sucked into false teaching. It is Christ alone who saves. Then Philippians, uh, which chronologically speaking was the next, um, next book written in a, about AD 61 uh, while Paul was in prison in Rome. This decade was a, a very bad time. For, for Christian persecution. 
And the message of the book of Philippians, don't give up when the going gets tough. And Paul's central message, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so in spite of appalling conditions, great opposition, no worldly influence at all, the gospel spread. Within 30 years of Christ's death, the gospel was being proclaimed in Rome, the capital city of the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. Just as God promised would happen. And 2,000 years later, over 2 billion people still believe in the gospel and follow Jesus Christ. How? The church grows, the kingdom spreads when the word of God is proclaimed. He did it then, he can do it now. If God says, it shall be so. He is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. So let's pray together. Let's just take a moment to take in how incredible that is, that promise that the gospel would go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the very ends of the earth. How unlikely that must have seemed right at the start. And yet, our God is a God of his word. And by the end of the book of Acts, there is the gospel being preached to the ends of the, ends of the earth. Lord, you are a wonderful promise-keeping God. And how you are the same God who works to spread the gospel. You're the same God who works in our lives. As we see your word, your promise being worked out in history, we can see your word being worked out in our lives, in our situation today. The same covenant-making, covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. And so we can fully put our trust in you. And in our day, as we see the gospel spreading around the world, we see you're still at work. Such an amazing thing to follow the God who always keeps his word, who can always be trusted. And so at the end of this installment, this evening, we simply say, Lord, all of our hope is in you. We trust you. You are the God who always fulfills his promises. So simply, we're in awe and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is the rock when I hit rock bottom Sure and solid ground when the land is foreign He's the cornerstone never to be shaken he will not be moved Jesus is the one Who has won the battle Anchor I can hold When the rest unravels He's victorious Never to be shaken He will not be moved The source of my love daily bread the hope of new life in him will rage and never dim the blood that Jesus spent is my life blood oh. it wandered off but 
His grace came running. I would still be lost, but His grace keeps coming. Grace for all my days, never to be shaken. of his, his death my daily bread, the hope of new life in hell, will rage and never dim, the blood that Jesus spent is my life oh. cause he will not be moved, no he will not be shaken, the way, the truth, the lie. Oh, he will not be moved. No, he will not be shaken. The way, the truth, the lie. Oh, 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 he will not be moved. No, he will not be shaken. The way, the truth, the lie. The source of my life is this The sacrifice of this His death my daily bread The hope of new life and hell Will rage and never dim The blood that Jesus spent Is my lifeblood And He will not be moved no, he will not be shaken The way, the truth, the lie Yes, Lord, he will not be moved No, he will not be shaken The way, the truth, the lie A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a savior The hope of nations Savior, he can move
My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, you can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered. Well, what a great time together and how great it is to see that the God who promised will take the gospel to the ends of the earth uh, is a God who is true to his word. And we see Paul preaching fearlessly in that place that's regarded as the ends of the earth. And we see still his gospel spreading around the world. And so I hope at the end of this service this evening, you're left with this like me, with a profound sense of amazement and gratitude and awe at the God who can work through the, 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 the centuries of time, through the free will and often um, sinfulness of human beings and still work his purposes out. And as we go into this new week, we have exactly the same God with exactly the same heart, exactly the same intention. And so we can have exactly the same confidence. I pray that as we go into this week, you, you go into the week with a real sense of confidence, a real sense that God is with us and he will do what he says he will do. And as the word of God is proclaimed in word and in deed, so his kingdom spreads, so his church grows. So have a great week, everyone. Have a confident week. Have a week where you expect to see uh, God at work in wonderful and miraculous ways. And we'll see you again next week.
journey be You say the present God Glory be to God most high Glory to the risen Jesus Christ Glory to the Spirit here in my life Always present.